All right, good morning, everyone. Open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 3. I'm going to be looking at one verse there in particular in just a little while, but it is good to be with you on this Lord's Day. I'm looking out over the audience this morning. We have visitors with us, and we're grateful that you've come our way again, and, and we're great, grateful that you have taken the time out of your travels or out of your busy schedules to join us for worship this morning. There was something that was stated in the, in the Bible class this morning that got me thinking about how individuals have, certain individuals have millions of followers and what can we do about it. I'm going to go ahead and, I, I think the elders have already announced this anyway, but I'm going to go ahead and say something about this. At the first of the year, Lord willing, and, and if all of the equipment gets in that's supposed to get in, and is installed, we're going to start live streaming our worship. We're going to be online. We're going to have a presence that we've not had before. That's going to be some of the things that we can do to try to get the truth out to individuals that may not be hearing the truth. We already record our sermons and, and put them online immediately following the, the service, but we're going to be starting to do something a little bit different. And hopefully it will have the, the effect that, that Peter had on the day of Pentecost when the gospel was being preached. It will prick people's hearts and cause them to ask, what must we do? And uh, hopefully we'll have the opportunities to be able to teach those individuals what it means to call on the name of the Lord. One of the things that's going to be necessary for them to call on the name of the Lord, though, is God's word. And the understanding that God's word is precious. Now I'm going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 1 here in just a moment. But I want you to, to be considering what is being stated here and what's going on within the context. Up until this time, Samuel is going to be the last of the judges. Eli and his sons have pretty much been the ones who have been influencing Israel to this point. And because of the horrible nature of Eli's two sons, you could say God has restricted the, the revelation that has been given to the children of Israel up to this point. What I see and in, in read in verse 1 is, is, Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days, and there was no widespread revelation. We're going to talk about that, and I'm going to throw up here on a slide in a little while another version of that because I like the American Standard Version's translation of this verse because it doesn't just say that it was rare. It uses the word precious. And I want to, we'll talk about that in a little while. But in this chapter, God calls Samuel as a young man to be God's, his next prophet. And he would replace Eli, but this first verse of this chapter talks about the preciousness of God's word. There has been different periods in the biblical history where God spoke directly to his people, and, and that's what he's doing now. But the word is precious. Let me, let me ask you this. Do you understand the value of your possessions? I would, I would say that one of the things that, and I don't know where this source, the source is unknown on this, but it said, we know the cost of everything and the value of nothing. And I thought that was an interesting statement. Because sometimes when it comes to our salvation, we know what the cost was. That was the life of Christ. But do we know and appreciate the value that it has in our lives? We know very much how much our vehicles cost because we have to go out and write a check for them or make monthly payments on them. But do we truly appreciate the value of transportation that they have given us? The convenience of transportation that we have today. The homes that we live in. Yeah, we know how much we pay for them. The bank knows how much we paid for them. But do we really appreciate the blessings, the value of the blessings that having a roof over our heads actually have? You know, some of those things we just take for granted, don't we? 
And the thing is similar with the Word of God. When I hear this, do you know how much your Bibles cost? You went to a bookstore, you ordered them online, mailed to you, you know, picked them up. Some of you, if I'm looking at some of the Bibles out there, you may not have had to buy a Bible in a long time because you've used the same one for a long, long time. I've got a couple in there in my office that are, that are quite old and worn, and I, I, I tend to like to use a new one every now and then. But I, I've got Bibles in my own uh, library that are 40-plus years old. You've probably got some that might be older than that. But, you know, the value of the Bible is not in how much it cost you when you bought it. The value of the Bible is in are you using it? Do you value God's Word? Is it precious to you or is it actually rare? I, I had an instance to see a family Bible one year sitting on a coffee table. And this was not a small family Bible either. This was pretty good size. And... I was afraid that it was put out there just to impress me because the pages didn't look worn at all from being t turned. And that happens quite a bit. You go to great extent, you have something that's an heirloom, but actually what value does that heirloom have if it's not used? The children of God, and, and let me just give you one more quick illustration in this, is that when I think of this, there is a time, a story that is told of a, of a man who loved old books. He met with an acquaintance who had just thrown away a Bible that had been stored in the attic of his parents' home for generations. He said, I couldn't read it. His friend looked at him and, and said, I couldn't read it because it was... Somebody named Guten something had print and printed it. Well, that Bible was one of the first books ever printed. And why? His friend explained to him, he said, that book, a book similar to that, a Bible similar to that, just sold for over a million dollars at auction recently. The guy looked at him and said, well, mine, mine wouldn't have sold for that much because some guy named Martin Luther scribbled all over mine. <laughs> well, the thing is, it doesn't matter if Martin Luther had done that or not. But this book that we say that we cherish, this book that we say that we honor, does it have value to us? Or is it, as what Samuel said, is it rare? Or what Samuel records, is it rare? Should it be precious to us? And so, going back again to verse 1, and, and looking at this particular verse again, the bottom half of the screen is the American Standard Version. And the child Samuel ministered unto Jehovah before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no frequent vision. And I know that the precious means that it was rare, in this particular context, but at the same time, the rarity of the Word of God is what gave it the value. They longed for it. They missed it, or it was missing in their lives, and they needed it. And there was something that, that under, they understood that this would take place. Old Testament history, going back to where God speaks to His prophets, and to hear these words that there was no widespread revelation, there was no visions taking place at this particular time, that had to have been discouraging to, to the children of Israel. You know, it's not going to be long. Samuel is, is going to serve as a judge, and people are going to grow tired uh, of him being their leader. They're going to cry out for a king. But at the same time, what they should have been crying, or the person they should have been crying to was their king, the God of heaven. They should have been longing and asking for, for him to spill forth his, pour forth his word to them. And therefore, the word of Jehovah, being rare or precious in those days, I would suggest to us that even though we have access 
to Bibles in so many different forms now. There's not a reason for anybody not to have one. You can get one online for free, just you know, a, a digital copy of it. They don't cost anything anymore. They're that available. But just because they're free, it doesn't mean that people value the word. So this morning, what I want us to do is understand that the law of supply and demand often dictates when a commodity is in demand and the supply is low, its worth is elevated or inflated. Maybe It may be that because the Word of God being the number one best-selling book in the world year in and year out, the availability of it online, now they, the supply in some people's minds has diminished the value when in its essence it should have been elevated. The value of the Word of God should be precious to every one of us. It should be such that, you know, we meditate upon it day and night. We talk about, like the, the psalmist did, about loving the law of the Lord, that it's sweeter than the honeycomb. Then we, we think about how, how valuable it is. It is there that we find salvation to our souls. There is such value to it. And so why should it be valuable to us today? Or have we entered a period of history in modern man's time, similar to that of Amos in Amos chapter 8, verses 11 through 12? Behold, days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east, then run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. It's not because of the availability of the word that it's rare, but the fact that people don't want to hear it that makes its value so rare. And the fact that the people seek it improperly. So this morning, why call the word precious? Well, I would suggest a few things to us today. That the words is precious because it comes from God. These are his thoughts. These are his words. It shows us his ways. It reveals himself, he reveals himself to us in them. And when I listen to King David as he talks about the omniscient God in Psalm 139, he says this, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. And he's talking about this omniscient God and, and all-powerful God and, and this all-knowing God and ever-present God. He's describing him. He said, your thoughts are precious to me. Why? Because the sum, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. More in number than the sand. Innumerable, in other words. It makes me reflect upon what John says about all the things that Jesus said and taught, the miracles that he performed, that even the books of the whole world could not contain them. But what we have should be precious to us. What we have should be so precious to us that what we hear in them are God's ways. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, His ways are not our ways, are they? His thoughts are not our thoughts. They are superior to us, our ways and our thoughts. And that's what is revealed to Isaiah in those verses. And then I hear Paul speak. In Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 35, where he talks about the depth and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How vast is it? But how much do we truly value it? And then he goes on to say, For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor? Well, we don't know it completely, but we know enough of it to know who he is. He has revealed it to us. And see, that's just it. The, the beauty behind all of this, the wisdom of God, it's confusing to man. 
It really is because we, we want to think of ourselves as, as ph philosophical thinkers. We want to think of, our, of ourselves as, as intelligent and, and, not need of and not need of any guidance. And yet God's words provide those very things to us. That wisdom of God confounds, confounds conventional wisdom of the world. And it blows my mind that when I think of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 through 25 in particular, you can look at those verses and you can hear Paul talk about God's wisdom. And you see how it does just that, this great wisdom of the world that we think of. He tells us, you don't know him. And we don't learn who God is through the wisdom of the world. We don't learn about God, and He doesn't reveal Himself to us through the wisdom of the world, but through His Word. It became a stumbling block to the Jews when you look at verse 25. It became or it's considered to be foolishness by the Gentiles in verse 24. And you hear Him in verse 25 say, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You see, our acceptance of the words of God as precious words is an attitude that produces a precious faith. It is something that should be in each of us when we open God's word. Our faith should be precious to us. This precious faith is such that in First Peter or Second Peter chapter one and one, it should be a like precious faith, something that we all share. To those who have obtained a like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. That's who Paul was writing to and he was talking to them of a like precious faith. How did they have that? Because they valued God's word. Well, this precious word then becomes our only standard. It should be the standard that we live by. It's the standard in which when we, when we address this, that we understand all Scripture is inspired of God. And unless we can get those that we talk to to agree to that fact, then they will not have or find value in God's Word. We at least have to be able to, to come to a conclusion that this book that we have came from God. If it didn't, then we might as well throw it away. But we believe, don't we, that all Scripture is inspired of God. We believe in the profitableness of it for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and instruction, for the training that in it that can make us complete, that it can fully equip us. We understand the doctrines of men are fallible because of where they originate. They originate within the minds of men. But the scriptures are God-breed. They are His words, His wisdom. And how are we to speak then today? As if it were the oracles of God. The utterances, according to the New American Standard Version. When we speak, we, we have a saying, and I'm going to say this. This is man-made. Speak where the Bible speaks. It'd be silent where it's silent. I think the principles are found within the scriptures, but that particular saying comes from the wisdom of men. This right here, according to Peter, is how we should do it. And it has the same thing. But we speak as if we're speaking words of God. And so I look at it, and I understand that this standard that God has given us helps us defend and identify those who are false teachers. Turn real quick in your Bibles for just to 2 Peter and look at verse chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2. Because in that particular chapter, the Apostle Peter really gives a, a very good definition, at least to his readers there, of what to be aware of what to look out for when it comes to those who do not teach the truth. When he says in verse 1, but there are also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought the, bought them, 
and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you and with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Just consider that what are we supposed to do? We are supposed to test everything that we hear. Try the spirits. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. You see, the Bible is an inexhaustible book of divine wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, is what the proverb writer says. It is the righteousness of God that is revealed that enables us to walk by faith. In it, all things that pertain to life and godliness are given to us. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. I heard someone or read somewhere the other day which, and a statement which I believe is incorrect. It says the Bible answers every question. No, it doesn't. But it does answer every question about God that you need to know. It does to answer every question about salvation that you need to know. It doesn't tell you why zebras have stripes, does it? And it doesn't tell you whether they're black stripes or white stripes. But it does tell you the things that you need to know to find God, to believe in His Son, and so that you can have eternal life. That's what Peter was talking about when he was saying... He's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. It determines for us what is right and what is wrong. We don't have to have a confused standard like we have in the world today where what is right for one person is wrong for another and what is wrong for one person is right for another. Isaiah addressed that when he wrote to, to the people of Israel when he said, Woe to those who call good evil and evil good. We live in a confused society where standards change every day. But the one thing I know about God's Word that makes it so valuable, it is, it is an unchanging standard. It is fair for everyone. It is just. And everyone can live by it. And from it, we learn obedience. We learn submission to the will of the Lord. We learn, as Joe mentioned in the announcements this morning, True worship, how to worship in spirit and in truth through God's Word. You see, God's precious Word to us is His saving power. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. I don't think you can quote that verse enough because it is the power of God unto salvation. That's the, the gospel. It is what points us in that direction. It has the power to discern the thoughts and the intents of man's heart. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. It has the ability to help us to understand if we are willing, according to James chapter 1 and verse 21, to receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to do what? Which is able to save your soul. See, the value of God's word to us today comes in our reception of it. When we allow it to permeate our lives. And what the word does, it begets us. James chapter 1 and verse 18, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth. You see... You go back to Ephesians chapter 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. But what has God done? By His grace, by the power of His Word, He's made us alive again. He's made those who, who could not resurrect their own souls to rise and walk in newness of life. The word sanctifies us. John chapter 17. Jesus during his prayer to the Father said, Sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth. 
And it's that very same word that actually sets us free. You shall know the truth and it shall set you free. You know those things. And that word then does what? That word will judge us in the end. John chapter 12 and verse 48. I believe Randy in the Wednesday night invitation mentioned this particular verse as well. This word, this precious word, this word that might be rare to some but should be valuable to, to everyone is going to be that which judges us. He who rejects me, this is what Jesus said, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. God in the flesh said this to us, said this to his, those. And so what that means then that we have been given free will. Uh, Linda Sexton's not here. I'm going to talk about free will. She sent me a text the other day. A friend of hers kind of misunderstands what free will is. She explained free will and, and, and the reason why she voted the way, this person, the way she voted was that God gave us free will so I can believe whatever I want to believe. Now, free will is God gave you the ability to make choices. He gave you the ability to obey or disobey. You could heed his word or refuse it. You could worship him the way he desires to be worshipped, or there's such a thing as vain worship, which when we think of vain worship, it's empty worship. It's, it's without value, and God doesn't accept vain worship. We can think of life of sin or a life of righteousness. Romans chapter 6, when Paul talks about a life of sin or a life of righteousness, he talks about being a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. And he was grateful that they were no longer slaves to sin. And that was a choice that they had to make. Free will is God gave us the ability to make up our own minds About him, about the world. He gave us the ability to choose a biblical worldview or a worldly worldview. He gave us the ability to choose between sin and righteousness. And so if we listen to and apply the precious word to our lives, good things happen. Eternal things can happen for us in that last day. And so this precious word reveals God's plan of salvation to us. And I mentioned in the Bible class this morning, salvation is not a formula. And I know I've got up here, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. But what this is right here is obedience to God's will. When you hear these words here, yes, we all have to hear Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. Not man's Word, but the Word of God. That's why the Word of God should be valuable. That's why the God, Word of God is precious to us. But we have to hear it. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. From the day of Pentecost until today, the same gospel message should be being preached throughout the world. world using what? The word of God. And then he that believes will do what? He'll nat he that hears it, if he's pricked in the heart like they were on the day of Pentecost, he's going to believe it. You know, Jesus talked about belief himself when he was preaching. He said, unless you believe that I am he, you will all die in your sins. You'll perish. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 16 talks about the necessity of belief. It was necessary for, the, for Paul, when he was Saul, to believe that Jesus Christ was his Lord and that he was doing something against him that needed to stop. It was Paul, or Saul, that Ananias went to to tell him what he needed to do that brought him to a point of faith that caused Paul to do what? Repent. 
Paul no longer would crucify or persecute Christians. But now, instead, he would preach the gospel. It brings us to a point of repentance. That faith moves us. The value of God's word moves us in the direction of God. It moves us toward him so that we can eventually be with him and in Christ. Repentance. Luke chapter 13, he talks about that very thing. If you don't repent, you'll, you'll perish. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, the apostle Paul at Mars Hill says that God in times past had done what? He had overlooked or winked at the ignorance of men, but the ignorance of men is no longer going to be acceptable according to what Paul says in that. But he says that God has now commanded all men everywhere to repent. That's from God's Word. And the idea of confession is more than lip service. Yes, we confess with the mouth unto salvation, according to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. That's true. But that confession isn't just words. It becomes a way of life. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you confess Him, that's meaning you want to put Him on in your life. That means you want to be in Him. It means you want to be united to Him. And what does that do according to the Word? It means that you'll be baptized. See Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16, and the Great Commission... Baptism was a command. Submission to the will of the Lord means we obey those commands. Remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? And then you come to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, and you have Peter there on that day of Pentecost. He's pricked these people in their hearts, and they cry out, What shall we do? And in verse 38, he answers them. He tells them what they need to do to call on the name of the Lord. Repent and be baptized. Some of you. No, he said every one of you. Ananias to the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We see these things in Scripture. Now, this is just part one of this lesson. There's going to be more. I'm going to stop right here. There's Christian living that's going to be involved in this. We're going to need to add to our faith. Being buried in baptism to rise and walk in newness of life implies something. That it doesn't end right there. There is a walk that is involved after that spiritual resurrection. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is a walk involved in that. That begins that very day. You walk as a child of God. Faithful to the very end so that you can receive a crown of life. And so you add to your faith virtue. To virtue knowledge. To knowledge self-control. To self-control perseverance. To perseverance godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to kindness you add Christian love, brotherly love. You add love. All of those things help make you complete as a child of God. And by walking faithfully, we will receive an imperishable crown of life. So I think the word of God is precious, not simply because it is rare, but because the value, the treasures, the pearls of God's wisdom that are found in it. And we need to think in those terms. Where would we be today without the precious word of God? Where would you be today if, if you were not here because you didn't have God's word? these pearls of wisdom, these golden treasures, we mine for them in God's word because it has value. And just think of the consequences if the plan of God had never been revealed to us. 
where would we be today? You know, we're about to sing a song of invitation. Go ahead and take out your songbooks. There's a great day coming. And I want to suggest to you that the reason we know that there's a great day coming is because of the precious word of God. It tells us that. Are you ready? Are you prepared to meet your God in that day? Have you valued his word? Has it been precious enough to you that you will take it, that you will use it, that you will allow it to work in your lives to bring you salvation? Then if you believe, then be obedient to God today. Can we help you in your soul salvation? Do you need baptism for the remission of sins? Or are you an erring child of God that, that needs to reconcile to God? We stand ready to assist you. Looking at God's word, there is nothing more precious and it will lead to, an e to you living eternally with God if you value it that much. Yes, there is a great day coming. So can we help you? Won't you come as together we stand and as we sing?